Remember a while back we were talking about IPv4 and how the addresses were becoming exhausted very quickly. One of those stop gaps uh, put in place was RFC 1918. So we had that private uh, ranges of addresses. But it also uh, we also defined NAT, which also is a stop gap. And NAT is network address translation. What that allows you to do is, as the name sounds, you translate, you uh, convert one IP to another. So for example, if you have some sort of internal IP, for example, you can translate that to some sort of public IP. And you can also do private to private, public to public, public to private, private to public, whatever direction you want to go. Uh, but most commonly, especially in home networks or small businesses, you're going to be going from private to public, and most likely you're going to have a whole network you're going to be translating to a public address. So not just one IP, but a number of them. So there are a couple different types of NAT, uh, one being one-to-one, -one, and we have a many-to-one, And then there's even uh, a many-to-many. -many. And that's based on basically having a single IP to a single IP, uh, having a network, such as some sort of subnet, to a single IP, or a network to a range of IPs. Most commonly, you're going to see many to one. That's that's where you have your home network, you have a whole 192.168 at home or something like that, or at a small business. You buy a single IP address, either dynamic or static, from your service provider, and, and then that gets your internal addresses get translated to that external address. So the idea being, you have some sort of internet cloud, you have a router, a bunch of networks coming off of that. And then that connects up to the internet. And on that internet connection, you'll have a single IP. And then internally, you'll have some sort of RFC 1918 scheme going on behind there, or a number of. And then whenever th these 1918 addresses try to connect to the internet, they will then uh, be translated as their source address will be translated to this public address. So that way, when the internet sees their traffic, it doesn't show as being from 192.168 something, which is not routable on the internet due to RFC 1918, uh, but it will show as whatever public address you have. So that way they know how to route back to you, and you're not using up 500 public IPs, you're just using one or two. Uh, so it's much greater efficient use of uh, the IP block, and it even offers a little bit of security. And if you ask any security professionals, it's really not, but it gives you the ability to uh, at least hide your network. Security through uh, obscurity. <laughs> so you have your uh, a number of addresses behind your router, and uh, any one of those could be accessing some sort of resources on the internet, and they all show as coming from one IP. So if someone attacks that one IP, unless they get into your router, they don't have a w way of determining what internal IP address actually creating that traffic. Uh, so that gives you a little bit of basic security of being able to hide your internal network. There's also a number of, uh, number of types of addresses in that, especially with Cisco. There's uh, a couple different terms used. So a couple of the terms are inside, local, and with a uh, different vendor, it's they may not have the same terminology, so just be aware of that. The idea is usually the same. Uh, it's just written differently. We have an inside global. There's an outside local. And an outside global. 
So the way this works is the inside local is the IP of the client being translated. The, outside, uh, the inside global is the address of your destination as seen from the interior of your network. So uh, if uh, I'll make a diagram of this as well. We have uh, outside local, the address of the destination, as seen from the inside network, which I'll show you how the, those differ and are similar, essentially. <laughs> and an outside global, which is uh, the destination seen from the outside network. And the best way to provide an example of that would be to, to draw out something like this. So uh, we'll have an inside and outside network. So let me blank this out. So let's pretend we have uh, some sort of router in the middle here. And we have our outside and the inside. So on the inside, we have some sort of computer and we have some sort of computer on the outside we're trying to get to. So we have some sort of connection between those. So for the inside network to get to the outside network it looks something like this. So you'll have your inside local and your outside local on its way to the outside. So when it first generates that packet, it's going to uh, look at the inside local and outside local. When it goes through the router, it'll then be translated to the inside global and the outside global. On the wave return, on the, the, the reverse of that, will then be your inside global and outside global. And then it'll get translated again once it hits your router into your inside local and outside local. So local refers to the inside of your network. Global refers to the outside of your network essentially. So at each of these steps you can do a translation and it'll make more sense when you get into the uh, physical configuration of it. Uh, but it's it, there, there's a certain way that these are often configured uh, which will make more sense once we get into the hands-on. Especially I know the with, with having those four terms it's kind of weird uh, but we'll we'll get there. There's also a uh, version of NAT for IPv6. So for IPv6, there's there's not necessarily a an, an exact version of NAT like we have for IPv4. Uh, there is the unique local address, which I believe I mentioned at one point, the ULA. So the unique local address is uh, specified in RFC uh, 4193, and it's meant to provide local only communication. So it's um, just like a private address range for your network. Uh, for IPv6 because it was requested so much that was added in relatively late stage but it doesn't solve any IP address space issues it's just here's a, here's a range you can use internally have fun that's about it uh, there's also NAT64 and NAT64 is the closest you'll get to 
a real level of NAT like we do with IPv4, uh, but it's not covered in CCNA. So NAT64 is really the closest you'll get to, to actual NAT. ULA is just like an RFC 1918 type idea. Uh, IPv4 is kind of has the, uh, the hold on NAT since it's been around for so long. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and configure some NAT and that'll make some more sense. Uh, there's also such a thing as PAT, which I didn't mention, and because we're, we're going to end up configuring that next. So PAT is port address translation. And what that means is when you get to a certain level of IP usage, uh, you, you may need to translate the port as well. So for example, uh, let me... Let me clear out some of this. With this translation, let's say you're coming from 192.168.1.10 and you're coming from port 1357 and you're trying to get to Google on 53. When you do that connection, the router is going to store that information in the table. These ports will then be used up, especially the, the especially the local side. So the local side, on occasion, can can run out of ports essentially. So uh, what'll happen is. You could have another computer using 1357. And then if he tries to access something as well, the router on our side is going to say, well, wait, I already have a 1357. So it's going to either fail on this translation, regardless of where you're trying to go, uh, or it's going to have to translate that port into something else. And it's going to have to keep in its table. Uh, its own little translation of okay well this isn't really 1357 it's actually 1457 I changed that so that he could then go out and talk to Google as well on port 53 for example uh, you can also use this to your advantage for port forwarding so when we get into that uh, it's not just for solving points where your network gets overloaded with too many addresses and too many ports, but uh, it can also be used to solve issues with uh, inbound translations. So if someone is trying to get to your public address on port 80 or something like that, uh, it'll go to an internal server on port 80 or something like that, or port 8080. So when it goes from this port to this port, that'll also be a port address translation. So the router can do that on the inbound as well as the outbound. So the outbound is used for more of uh, what's called overloading. So it's, it's basically called NAT overload, which allows you to run a whole ton of internal IPs and whatever ports they come up with on one public IP, uh, whereas the inbound is used more for server access and things to a DMZ. Uh, and this will make more sense when we get into the configuration side. We'll, we'll see what this actually means uh, in the real world.